today. Uh, I'm Shane, this is Paul, and together we're leading platform development for Mainframe. Uh, so I'll start maybe by telling you what Mainframe is, uh, which is a platform for decentralized applications. And really what this means is that we are going to provide an environment, an SDK, for developers to build applications using decentralized infrastructure. Um, and uh, some of the values that we, we want to bring to our platform is that it be uh, censorship resistant, private, self-incentivized, secure, surveillance resistant, and unstoppable. And really, the only way to get these things all together is through a decentralized system. Um, I'm actually going to start by making a small distinction between uh, decentralized applications and decentralized web. Um, so I kind of think of decentralized web more uh, closer to the traditional web browser model, um, but maybe with some plugins to access decentralized uh, storage. So maybe something like uh, Mist. Um, but uh, we're focused more on the de on DApps, decentralized applications, um, where you have self-contained business logic, and then dynamic content inside this application. Um, so uh, we're really focusing something that's closer to the iOS or Android application model uh, rather than the classic web model. Um, so in the web model where you have, in the web 2.0 model where you have all your business logic is happening on servers in the cloud, we're trying to bring that logic back onto the client and give control back to the users. Um, so uh, our uh, application platform is something that we're calling Mainframe OS. Um, now it's not a new type of operating system, but it shares a lot of similarities. So if you think about a classical operating system, you have, uh, it's a piece of software that runs on your computer, and it, it regulates access to a set of services or hardware on your computer, whether that be memory, uh, networking, storage, and um, applications then run on top of this and must ask the operating system for access to these services. And this is what we're doing with Mainframe OS as well. So <clears throat> uh, we have a sandbox execution environment. So this is where the, uh, the dApps will run. And it kind of restricts what they can do, uh, how they can access like your computer or uh, interact with each other. Um, we have a permissioned access to a system of services. Um, so th this is the decentralized infrastructure. Um, and the, the applications must request permissions from the user in order to interact with these services. Um, and we also have protected system control data. So this could be things like encryption keys, uh, your contacts, files that live on your system. And these are things that maybe you want to use across like a bunch of applications, but you don't necessarily want a single application to control this data. Um, and really what we're aiming at here is uh, to cater to two groups, uh, developers on one side and users on the other. So we want to empower developers and give them uh, the tools they need to uh, more easily be able to create decentralized applications. And we want to protect users from uh, like data harvesting and really kind of maintain their privacy. Um, so uh, as we continue, we're going to talk about these two uh, uh, groups that we're focusing on. Um, and I'll tell you um, what we're doing for the developers, and then I'll hand over to Paul for when we kind of cross over into user land. Uh, so this is um, what the mainframe OS architecture looks like. So uh, it's a layer on top of uh, what we're calling service layers. Um, so this could be something like blockchain, uh, it could be storage communications, and uh, Mainframe OS acts as a layer in between these services and your DAP. And um, so the, the benefits to the developer here are uh, there's no need to evaluate. So uh, if a developer needs to uh, integrate, say, a decentralized storage, um, typically they'll go and see what all the options are, try to evaluate them, look at the technical considerations, the market share of each of these projects. Um, but really, um, we're kind of doing that due diligence for you and saying this is the service layer for what you, or this is the correct storage layer for what, what you want to do. 
Um, it also has the benefit of the developer doesn't need to now convince users to install or configure this service layer on their own computer, um, creating this extra burden to uh, user onboarding. Um, and <clears throat> uh, we also want to provide sensible defaults in these service layers that aim to preserve user privacy, uh, which may not always be like the most obvious thing when you're using one of these uh, service layers. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the first service layers we've integrated are Ethereum and Swarm. Um, so they're providing kind of some initial functionality here. Um, but uh, for some of these other service layers, we're going to need to in, uh, collaborate with other projects and uh, have them integrated in mainframe OS. Um, another benefit to providing all these service layers as a single package is to provide integrations between the service layers. So um, an example could be uh, you're d you want to notify another user that you've uh, uploaded a, an encrypted file for them. Um, so for example, that could be d handled as a single operation that uh, say first goes to the identity service, gets a user's encryption key, encrypts the file, then goes to the storage layer, uploads the file, and then goes to the communications layer and sends out the notification. So this could be handled maybe as like a single operation rather than a, rather than a developer having to like knit these layers together. Um, uh, so we're also focusing on providing high level uh, APIs versus um, some of the APIs that exist in uh, uh, the, the service layers that we're looking at. So uh, my example here is using PSS to set up a communications channel. Um, so in order to do this, if anyone has developed anything using PSS, this will be familiar to them. So the first step is kind of like a UX step uh, because you need to exchange keys with another user, um, uh, swarm addresses, and some other metadata. And um, you, as a developer, need to think about this because it's like, OK, um, how do I connect my users together? And you need to design a flow for them to be able to do this. Once you've done this, you can start writing the code, which is um, uh, generate a topic, uh, set, set the public keys, subscribe to the topic, and then you can start sending messages. Um, so we can't think we can kind of simplify these APIs a little, uh, leveraging some of the like integrations we have in the service layers. So for example, this is what the mainframe communications API could look like. Uh, so the first step here would be to prompt the user to choose one of their existing contacts. And this would really facilitate this out-of-band uh, handshaking that's happening uh, just if you're building something with raw PSS. Um, then we can uh, have more intent-based um, APIs. So we're opening a channel, we're subscribing, and we're sending data. Um, so this, I think, helps kind of hide some of the complexity and platform idiosyncrasies from the developer. Uh, which, while necessary at a lower level, maybe a developer doesn't necessarily want to learn like all the implementation details of uh, one of these service layers. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Paul for a minute to talk about UX. So as Shane was saying, um, beyond developers, we are really focusing on users and how um, they, can, they can be onboarded on the system, how we can make it easy for them, especially if they are new to this uh, decentralized ecosystem. Um, so one of the decisions we've made is to, um, to to handle in, in the mainframe OS directly uh, their identities, their wallet, and essentially any personal data they might have so, um, so we can safeguard it. And the advantage for users is that then they don't need to log in because this is something that all these things will be handled by the system itself uh, rather by th than the individual dApps. Uh, so this is essentially having a single platform for all these apps um, that can be that can uh, run in this uh, in a tr trusted way through the sandbox. Um, and we do everything we can so that user always controls their own data. So uh, trying to prevent apps from uh, leaking information about the users uh, without 
having a prompt uh, to the user asking if they if they actually agree to to sharing this information and so because this this client the mainframe os uh, is handling uh, signature and encryption keys it can handle authentication um, and, and verification on its own. So there is no need for trusted third-party servers in order to provide any of the functionality. So part of the user onboarding, um, we are creating identities and wallets or importing existing wallets uh, to be managed by the mainframe, mainframe OS. And all this data is encrypted um, at rest using a, a, a user-generated password uh, in something we call the vault. And the vault is essentially um, a single file so that it is encrypted so that it can be easily backed up by the user uh, using any, any service or USB key or anything they want. Uh, and eventually transfer to a new device in case they, um, they want to use a new laptop or anything else. And so um, all of these are providing the same advantages for developers because um, as they, don't, uh, they don't need to handle all these things with, with their apps. Uh, it's, it's all provided by the system. So I'll dig a bit more into user identities and what we mean really by user identities are essentially signature keys uh, over which we add some, uh, some metadata that can be, for example, some profile information such as a username, email address, or anything else they, they want to add. Uh, and potentially also some encryption keys so that we can encrypt files for them or um, specific messages. So these identities can be shared across apps. Um, so again, it's very easy for users to use the same identity uh, in different apps or a single throwaway identity for each individual app if they choose to. And the apps themselves, they don't have access to this list of identities, they only have uh, access to the one chosen by the user to run this app. So there is no, no way for the apps to do some correlation across these different identities unless uh, the user uh, agrees to. So this is an example UI, so it's, it's really work in progress. It's not going to look like this over the coming months. Um, but what it's showing essentially is when and user starts an app, uh, they are first prompted to choose what identity they want to, to run the app with. Um, so here uh, there is one entry in the list and also having a very easy way to just create a new identity right there before, before starting the app. So another thing we are managing in, in the OS itself are contacts and what we call contacts are essentially just other people's identity um, that the user wants to interact with uh, and that can be managed by, by the system as well. So users have full control over these contacts, notably over accepting them, um, and that is essentially a way of preventing spam in that in order to establish a communication with someone else, you first need to invite them and have them accept your contact request. And as the rest of the data, so contacts can be shared between the different apps. There is no lock-in, so if you are creating a social network in, in one app and just want to use another app, uh, you could be importing your entire social network and continue interacting with your contacts because as with everything else, uh, data belongs to the user. So regarding wallet management, uh, so we're managing a single or multiple wallets across the apps um, in case users want to, to switch for some specific use cases. Um, we have hardware wallet support for additional security. And obviously, um, Transactions are also handled by the system, um, so, so it requires the user approval before anything can, can go through to the underlying service layer. 
So this is an example UI, again, uh, very temporary uh, thing until we do some more UX work. Uh, but what it's showing here is really having an app running in a sandbox and trying to make a transfer of five mainframe token from a user address to uh, another address. And here's um, so the trusted UI uh, that we can see here it really takes over from, from the app to prompt the user for confirmation. Uh, Shane is now going to talk about the app authoring. Um, so we really wanted to make it like as simple as possible for developers to just like open this, um, create a new DAP, and then start just hacking away or kind of playing around with the APIs, maybe doing some ex example projects. Um, so, and basically all of this is handled inside the mainframe OS application. So um, you can initialize and do all your testing just inside mainframe OS. Um, so this is what it looks like creating an app. Uh, you're asked to fill in some metadata about your application and where the source files live. Um, then it's displayed in the kind of developer area in mainframe OS, and here is where you kind of access flows like uh, uh, like run it for testing. You can get all your uh, debug output. Um, you can manage like publishing and updates. Um, so when you're uh, when you've um, when you've tested your code and you're happy enough that you want to uh, submit a version to uh, be published, um, you take all your uh, static uh, assets and code and you publish to the storage layer, which is Swarm. Um, then one of the nice things about Swarm is because it's uh, content referenced, uh, it ensures like the integrity of your code. So uh, whatever the user is downloading is guaranteed to be like the code that you've uploaded. Um, and then we also have like a manifest that's uh, that goes along with this uh, with your assets, and this contains things like uh, the versioning, the name of the application, um, some signature key, uh, some signatures that you make against the application, and um, permissions so which service layers you're going to in, uh, interact with, and so all this. These steps are actually all just handled automatically by Mainframe OS. It should be just a, a matter of clicking publish, and these things are happening in the background for you. Um, and this is the same flow as well for deploying updates. So we're planning on using Swarm feeds for this. So once uh, once you've tested your updates, um, you go through this step again. Again, it will probably just be click update, um, and it will publish the update uh, manifest to your feed then uh, any users who have already downloaded your application can detect this update, uh, be prompted to see if they want to download it, and they'll also do all the, all the signature verification to prove that like you as the original developer also published this update, um, just so malicious developers can't publish malicious updates. Um, so I mentioned a little bit about permissions in the manifest, but I'll let Paul tell you a little bit more about those. So the reason we are uh, asking developers to set permissions in the manifest in, in the first place um, is uh, in order to, to provide these transparencies to, um, to users before they install apps over what uh, this app is actually going to do and give them the choice not to, to even not install the app if uh, it seems malicious. Um, so all these required permissions need to be defined up front and wh what we um, define as required permissions are the ones that provide the core functionalities of the app and um, users shouldn't even install the app if they are not willing to grant these permissions because the app is not going to work. And another type of permissions we have is what we call the runtime permissions and that can provide maybe additional functionality for an app but wouldn't be required if uh, to, to in order to run the core core functionalities, uh, and so this can be granted later. And as all these applications run in a sandbox, uh, these permissions are in, are enforced by the system itself. Uh, so, for example, uh, one of the idea of this permission is that uh, we are running a firewall over HTTP request, and so. 
if you have a not taking app that is having a required permission over making calls to Facebook, you might see things that it's quite fishy and not, not want to, to use this app at all. So this is an example UI um, of what happens when a user tr imports a manifest in order to install an app. And it's first showing, so what are the required permissions? Here we, we don't have any required permission. Uh, but you can see among the optional one, we have uh, this app asking to make requests to mainframe.com. And here the user can choose to, to either grant this permission always or, or not at all, and so it will never be prompted uh, afterwards, or to ask for any, any requests that would need to be done. Um, so here we have this app, uh, Onyx Taking, that is running in the sandbox. So as you can see on the um, top, top of the screen, uh, there is this really thin um, white background bar, with, uh, which is a trusted UI, so it contains the title, uh, what user is logged in. So this is some UI that is controlled by the system and can be trusted by the user while all the rest is uh, really the sandbox and whatever the application chooses to run. And so when the app is actually trying to, to make this call to mainframe.com, that's when um, the, the system is intercepting this call and based on the user configuration for this app, ask uh, if the user wants to, to accept this call or not uh, in this very specific case. So we are already trying to build on mainframe. Um, we released our first alpha uh, a month ago. That was really more of a proof of concept for us to, to try to see how things could work end to end uh, from the front end to the service layers integration. So it's not really ready yet, but uh, still works in, in progress. Uh, hopefully our next release will uh, go further in providing uh, way more integrations with uh, service layers and higher level APIs uh, with this, these different services. So um, stay tuned for updates. Uh, you can follow our development on the Mainframe HQ organization and as Many, many other companies we are hiring, so don't hesitate to come talk to us when you feel like it. Thank you. Do you have any questions? So you mentioned that right now you are not focusing that much on web apps, but rather like iOS, Android, and desktop, if I understand correctly. So how do you plan to solve the problem that, for example, on iOS, the apps are sandboxed to each other and they can only interact with each other when the, when the author is the same? So, <clears throat> so that if, uh, if I have, like, um, so if I have several apps and they are sharing mainframe, how, where, where the data is stored and how they can interact with, like, the wallet and the keys and whatever. Um, so at the moment we are not, we haven't started to work on mobile devices, um, but the idea is that because we are using web technologies for, for the sandbox, uh, this is already what is supported by, um, by iOS and Android to, to have this interaction and to have this sandboxing with the web view. So that's our idea for now is to, to have this web view and, and having the same kind of uh, trusted environment uh, on top of it, so we can we can provide this uh, this security as well. Uh, but I think I think as well, um, maybe to clarify my point, the point I was making was more about following this architecture. Uh, so even though the applications will run like on a desktop, um, and mainframe OS is currently only the built for desktop. Um, I think mobile apps are a little further into the future once um, light clients are a bit more stable everywhere. So um, sorry, maybe if that wasn't clear. Uh, yeah, I was just referring to like the programming model more than anything. Thank you. Any other questions? So if not, so thank you very much, Mainframe. <laughs>